Uh, this talk will be in English because it will be filmed, and we'd like to make use of that later. Uh, Amir is currently VP of Developer Experience at Twitch, an Amazon company. Uh, he's he was also the head of developer relations at Slack, and honestly, this guy's resume could go on for miles. Uh, so without further ado, Amir Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, because I can't hear the mic. You're good? We're good? Okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for uh, hosting me. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, bots um, and how they're going to empower our life. Uh, at any moment, at any time, if this is boring, you can do like this, and I can show you a slideshow of my life in New Zealand. I lived for two years there. Um, it was a lot of fun, so we can go through slides of my life there. Um, but let's start with a little bit about me. Um, I apologize that you have to see two versions of me on stage. Um, I started at Microsoft. I started a few startups, sold one, crashed another two. So um, from a statistical perspective, I did good. Uh, then I worked at uh, Microsoft, working with developers all across Israel, um, connecting them to .NET technologies. Uh, went to two years in New Zealand, as I told you. Came back and started working for uh, Google. Uh, at Google, I opened up Campus. Do you know Campus? Uh, Google Campus, uh, the floor there. I uh, co-founded that with Professor Yossi Matias. Um, and then Google asked me to run uh, the startup engagement for Google all across the world. Uh, so I moved to uh, Mountain View five years ago and started working there. Uh, after a couple of years there, uh, a small startup uh, called me, a uh, Googler from a small startup called me and said that um, she wants to open up a platform for a, for a startup called Slack. And I said, yeah, I, I love Slack. That's awesome. So I joined Slack. We were 100 people. Uh, we had 100 uh, developers working on the platform. And when I left two years later, um, we had 200,000 developers working on our platform. And we had 2,000 people in the company. So the company really blew up uh, amazingly in the, in the last uh, two years. Um, and if you're very bad with your math and you confuse correlation with causation, you would say that I choose company based on their company logo colors. That is false. Uh, because what, what happens next is that a year ago, uh, I was asked uh, by Amazon, which is not a, in this picture, but um, to join one of their subsidiaries called Twitch. Um, how many of you use Twitch? OK, awesome. For those of you who don't, uh, Twitch is a startup acquired two years ago uh, by close to a billion dollars by Amazon. What it does, it lets people stream their games. Uh, how many of you play Fortnite or PUBG? Or, oh wow, you, you always work, you don't play. <laughs> you should play more. Um, so for those of you whose kids are playing PUBG or Fortnite or any of these uh, awesome games, uh, they could stream their games uh, live on Twitch and uh, create communities and make a lot of money. Um, so we have about uh, we have hundreds of thousands of people who we write checks to every month for playing their favorite video games on their computers. So that's a little bit mind blowing. Uh, and just to give you an order of magnitude, how big uh, this thing is, Fortnite, which I hope you know, uh, has been broadcasted uh, more than sorry, have been viewed more than seventeen thousand years of watching in the first six months of this year. And that's two hours per man, woman, and child in the US. OK, and it's not in the US alone. So it's a, it's a crazy uh, order of magnitude of a new thing. You used to, we used to watch NBA at 4 in the morning. Our kids watch Fortnite at, all the time. OK, so that's Twitch. What I do at Twitch is I run uh, the engineering uh, and the product uh, for the infrastructure. Uh, for first-party developers, for engineers that are building Twitch, and for third-party developers, companies like Blizzard, Riot, uh, EA, Electronic Arts, that build on top of our platform. Um, and because I have a lot of time, being a VP is very easy, I have a lot of spare time. Uh, I also write uh, books for O'Reilly, so I wrote uh, Designing Bots, which I, it's going to be the topic of this uh, talk, and also uh, Designing Web API, which I uh, just released this year. 
Okay. By the way, questions at any moment will be welcome. Okay, so what are, let's talk about bots. We wanted to, um, you've asked for a presentation about bots. Um, and I wrote a book about bots. But before we talk about bots, let's define what bots are. Because this is important. I've seen a lot of startups in the Silicon Valley where they call themselves a bot startup. That's not a thing. From my perspective, a bot is a new user interface. We moved from desktop to web, and from web to mobile, and from mobile to something else. The, something, the new something else is a bot. It's a conversational user interface where software, services, or products are accessed into our mind, or plugged into our mind, not through an app or through a web page, but through a conversational interface. We talk to the software. Why is this important? Why am I stressing this point? Because of two things. One of them is that bots are only as good as the service or product they expose. If you have a shitty service or product, your bot will suck. So building a bot does not solve providing a good service for your customers. The second thing is the big opportunity. When, uh, when the web started, there was a startup uh, that wanted to move your company's CRM to the web. And everybody told them, especially Oracle, who was the incumbent at the time, that moving to the web is, is a bad idea. They said that, like, who would put their information, uh, their client information, on the web? And now, if you live in, this, in, in the Silicon Valley, and you, you live in uh, San Francisco, uh, like me, you will see the biggest building is Salesforce. They made the bets on the new user interface. They created an experience that is unique to that user interface, and they conquer the market. So you have an opportunity, whenever there's a new user interface in town, to change the world and to create a unique experience that is unparalleled in other experiences and really take the market. So that's the opportunity of bots. OK? Does that make sense? Too early in the morning? No? OK. <laughs> So let's look at some of the use cases um, that I use bots every day. Um, we wake up in the morning and we have an Alexa. How many of you have an Alexa or Google Home? Does it work in Israel? It does. Yeah, it sort of works. Okay, so it sort of works. Uh, in the States, it's really plugged in into our life. We, walk, we wake up, our kids ask Alexa or Google Home, depending on the room they're at, uh, where, what to wear. Um, how, how long will it take us to go to their school and to play their favorite song? They actually compare between Alexa and Google Home, saying some, one of them is more nicer and the other one is smarter. Uh, so they actually personify these conversational bots. They use that all the time. Uh, we have a problem now in our house is that our neighbor, she shouts at Alexa and our Alexa responds from time to time. So. <laughs> Like the, the, their kids put uh, loud songs, and then our neighbor shout out, Alexa, stop! And then our Alexa stops uh, their music. So it's an interesting uh, experience. Um, customer support, very, very big now in the US. Um, you, Twitter and other companies have provided uh, service providers with the ability to provide customer support through their messaging. So you can go into Twitter, or you can go into Facebook Messenger, and actually get your uh, tickets from your messenger. That is pretty wild. Uh, something that I use, I used to use every day. Now I have an actual uh, executive assistant. But when I was at Slack, I had Amy. Amy is a bot. Um, it's an email. Uh, it's a startup called X.AI in New York. Uh, and all of you could register to that to Amy. Uh, and what it does, it helps you set up meetings with external uh, people. So when somebody says, hey, Amir, I want to talk about the Slack platform, I CC Amy and said, adding Amy who can help us set this up. Amy has access to my calendar, and, sh and, and it starts sending uh, messages until it books uh, 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 the meeting. When I tell people that Amy is software, their jaw drops. I talked to the founder of Amy. Amy got love letters. Uh, people send thank you letters to Amy and CC me as the manager so that I know how awesome Amy is. Uh, Amy has a brother now because they're thinking about diversity, so you can choose between Amy and Andrew. Um, so you can actually see how uh, this amazing augmented experience 
that is powered actually by a very traditional medium such as mail creates uh, an experience that is unparalleled uh, and actually solves a problem. So I, I paid Amy about uh, $50 a month, which is a lot of money for enterprise software for a seat, uh, but it was about 10 cents an email. If, if you count the amount of email it sent on my behalf, it is really, really uh, affordable. Um, this is another great bot. Do you use Slack here? Yes, I've seen Leary Slack everyone at here. Um, so we use StatsBot, which is a company that Slack also invested in. And what StatsBot is, does, it, you can connect StatsBot to uh, Mixpanel, to Google Analytics, to your own database, and then start querying StatsBot about uh, statistics. So you can say, hey, give me uh, my uh, site uh, information based on how many users and where they're coming from. And using natural language, uh, you can actually interrogate your information. And what StatsBot does, it collects all this information, all these silos, and gives you a one person or a person to talk to about all this information. So it's basically like a data scientist, a light data scientist, um, that has all these data sources. Very, very good. Uh, do you use bots in your Slack? Do you have Slack yes. integrations? OK, awesome. Thank you. That's my part of the code. Uh, uh, this is another interesting, uh, talking about Salesforce, this is another great uh, example that we use at Slack all the time. We connected Slack into uh, Salesforce. Uh, and I could tell you that none of the execs at Slack know their Salesforce password because they don't need to log in to, to Salesforce. They get all the information straight from within Slack. Uh, and that was like mind blowing. Once I talked to all the, to Stuart Butterfield and all the rest, and they said, yeah, we don't use Salesforce. We use Slack and integration to Salesforce. Um, okay, so now we've talked about a few examples. I want to talk about the flow of uh, where did we start with bots and where are we going with bots? The first set of bots were just notifications. I'm sure you have a lot of those. Um, bots that send notification when something happened. A task has been done, a reminder, uh, a task in Jira, a bug in Bugzilla. All of these are like simple notifications that let you know that something has happened. For example, when I registered here at Envoy, if you have the Envoy integration, uh, the person would have gotten a, a notification that I have arrived, which is pretty awesome. Um, then, the, then came conversational uh, interfaces. Um, and the key here, the key promise with a pure conversation interface is that you have a personal assistant that lives inside uh, your, um, your messaging platform. How many of you like to do expense reports? Usually, nobody raises their, their hands. It's, it's quite astonishing. But if you think about it, we should all love expense reports. I paid for something, and now the company is paying me back. We should wake up in the morning saying, yes, this is expense report day. Ha ha. But it doesn't happen. Why? Why doesn't it happen? Because the, the user interface sucks. Because it provides us with a suboptimal that just it looks like the software is aimed not to make us do the expenses, which might be true. I don't know. Maybe they sell their software based on like nobody will ever do expenses using our software. Please install our expense reports. Um, but think of a world, and we actually do that in Slack, where you can just upload your receipts to a certain channel or to a certain bot, and from there, all of your uh, expense report is done. Wouldn't that be awesome? So there's actually integration with Expensify and other software that lets us do this, what is cumbersome and not very nice uh, tasks, automatically. Um, and then we moved from conversation to her actually talking to a bot to a modern uh, conversation, which is we want to integrate. What we found out is that bots um, are awesome, but People don't really want to talk to people. They want to get shit done. So combination of conversation, of talking, together with rich interfaces, is the winning uh, way of doing uh, tasks in conversations. So we added forms, and we added buttons, 
Um, and what we found out is that people really like green buttons. If you give them a green button, even if it says cancel, they'll click on it. Um, it, it, creates a, a, it creates an experience where people know what to do, and you can actually prompt them to do the right thing using a combination of conversational interface together with traditional things like forms and autocompletes. So, okay, so we talked about uh, different, the different mediums and how we progressed with the bot's user interface. Let's uh, talk a little bit about how everybody uh, is bidding on this, on this platform and see a few examples. Um, so the first one is Messenger. Uh, at F8, in the last three years, uh, one of the big themes was, were bots. Um, they did a few mistakes uh, from my uh, perspective, focusing on amount of bots rather than the quality of bots. How many of you uh, know that there's 10,000 bots in, in Messenger? How many of you actually use any of these bots? Yeah, maybe a few, three, four, right? I would rather have three or four useful bots that all of us use rather than 10,000 uh, bots that are pretty useless. So I'm still hoping that that team uh, will get their um, bearings straight, and, and I think they are. Um, Twitter is getting into the game. They're providing an API. By the way, this is also interesting for you because there's a lot of opportunity to do uh, some uh, ads or any type of integration to your service. Uh, so Twitter, it's a limited beta for certain partners, but with United, if you go to the United uh, handle and you start talking to it in DM, you can actually query your United flight status inside Twitter. Um, this is an interesting use case. This is a, a startup that actually uh, I invested in. It's called Swelly. And what it does, it prompts users with users who are usually teenagers with two photos. What would you choose? This one or this one? Now, I don't do carbs, so I wouldn't choose either, but uh, teenagers choose something. And this provides Swelly with, and, and this is a game. They keep on uh, testing and testing and testing. People, most kids an answer about 75 questions like this on a given day, and they get a very, very good analysis of what the audience is running. So now the next stage would be for brands to run experiments. What type of shoe do you like? Do you like this shoe or do you like this shoe? and they could get a lot of insights into what their customers are actually uh, uh, want using a bot. Uh, this is another interesting, uh, how many of you know Kick? Again, not your age range. Uh, Kick is, uh, uh, I think, uh, it's between 13 and 17 in the US. Uh, and what it does, it has a, um, a bot that is one of the teenager's uh, favorite uh, user. She's a model. And what they told me is that the model, the bot model, offers discounts for these teens. And the click-through rate on this is 75%. And what they told me is that the kids, if they don't get the, the coupon, they ask the bot for the coupon. Who here ever asked for an ad? It's mind-blowing that people, they, they think that they're not getting this coupon, that the, that the model doesn't like them. So they actually go and ask for the coupon so that they could execute on the monetization of the bot, which is, for me, a little bit like mind-blowing. Um, this is uh, what Google does. So Google is now connecting all of their services uh, into their uh, Google uh, Home. They also have an uh, app that you can talk to the Google uh, Home, uh, and they connected all of their e-commerce and maps into the service. Okay, I want to, uh, so we, talk, we looked at a few use cases. I want to give you uh, a little bit of like, what is AI and how does AI connect to bots? Uh, because a lot of people think that a bot needs AI and it's really hard to build a bot because you have to have an AI and AI is actually intelligence is gonna kill us all. And all of these statements are false. Um, AI is a tool set. Uh, do you use AI in, I'm sure you use AI, right? Uh, AI is a tool set that developers could use in order to develop software. Uh, it's actually not a single thing. It's a set of, uh, of, of tools uh, that you can, uh, with bots, uh, enable user interaction. 
AI is not a general intelligence. It will not kill us in the near future. I apologize to the future gods for saying that. Um, it's not malicious or intentional. Uh, it is just like a for loop. If you run a for loop and it's evil, then it's evil, but you wrote it. So it's the same thing uh, with, uh, with AI. And, it, and here, it's purely conversational. So it helps you build a conversation. Oh, sorry, it's not purely conversational. You can use it for many, many other services. Sorry, that was a brain dump. Um, I want to give you, um, this is uh, what Google provides uh, developers with AI. There's cloud uh, speech that helps you synthesize, uh, like analyze voice, natural language understanding, video, uh, finding uh, images or objects in a video, uh, vision. I'll show an example of the vision. Translation uses uh, AI, and CloudML is actually uh, a model that you can build by yourself. There's also API.ai that lets you build conversational interface. What we're talking here, when if you want to use uh, AI with bots, is to use natural language understanding. Natural language understanding helps you, as a developer, analyze what the users told you, and to give you uh, an easy way to retort back. So let's do an example. I'm going to say, um, I want to see Batman this weekend, uh, preferably Friday night. So what is my intent? What do I want to do? To see a movie, exactly. I didn't say a movie, but I want to see a movie. So the AI, if you, if you develop uh, a software that analyzes what I said, it would probably, the intent would be Batman or to get a figurine of a Batman or something like that. I want to see Batman, right? There's an object that I want to see. But an AI could help you say, hey, no, the user is actually the intent is a movie. And one of the entities is the name of the movie, which is Batman. And the time is uh, Friday evening, right? So it could take the, your words and translate them into intents and entities to help you analyze what the user has said. So that that is what natural language understanding is. Uh, so with notifications, you actually don't need to use AI. Uh, with most workflows, you actually don't need to use AI. And sometimes when you have conversation, when you're building a purely conversational bot with a lot of steps, and you want to understand something like, I want to see Batman this Friday, then you could use AI to actually uh, parse the user in inputs. And from my perspective, AI helps you avoid this. Because this is what the first year of bots look like. What do we want? Chatbots. When do we want them? Sorry, I don't understand the requests. So uh, AI could help you do that. Uh, but it could also do something like this. Uh, when I first got the Google Home uh, bot, it was a textual, it was a chat app. And my friends at Google gave me, um, gave me the app to try to break. Like I'm sure you do with other friends. You give them software. There are, there are other engineers, and they help you uh, fuck with the system and try to break your bots. So I took the Google Home, and I started uh, playing with it. And then uh, it asked me a few questions. I asked them a few questions. I asked it a few questions. And then I said, OK, I'm going to upload a photo of my cat. Let's see what the bot does now. It's going to break my friend's code. And the minute I did that, it blew my mind. Because the bot said, yeah, I can see images and start a conversation about cats. And that, for me, is a magical moment. And it's actually not using natural language understanding AI. It's using image recognition AI. I upload an image. It uses another facet of AI, analyzes what I wanted to talk about from an image, and starts a conversation. That is mind blowing. That is where you can actually create magic when your intent doesn't matter if you upload a photo, or, or talk, or hum a, a sound, and you can recognize what the sound that I'm humming right now. This is where uh, interactions like we, we have with other humans is very similar to what we have with software. OK, so uh, I want to give you a run through of how Slack platform uh, did this. Um, so this is the growth of, of Slack in the first uh, two years. Um, as you, can, uh, as you can see, this is the hockey stick that every company likes to see. Uh, and it's still growing in the same uh, derivative of the derivative. So the, the company is still growing. 
Uh, there's words that it will IPO next year, I really hope. I don't have any inside information about that. Um, and the promise when I joined was the, the wor world is fragmented. Our world of work is fragmented. We want to connect all these, wor all these uh, workloads into a single thing. We have tabs. We have apps. We have uh, all these work that we do is fragmented across, and we wanted to connect these all together. So we said, we're going to create an operating system for work. And the interface is going to be chat and bots. And this is like a nice marketing slide that makes you feel like you want to run in the rain or something. Uh, so we talked about Envoy. We talked about uh, the Envoy app. What, what is really awesome with the Envoy app is that if you look at the other, I'll, I'll, the, uh, the alternative, the alternative is that the receptionist calls you or texts you or does something and it, it takes a lot of time. And it's very cumbersome. Once you do this with a bot, the key with this user interface is that it's better than the alternative that kind of suck, right? Like every user interface, you need to think about what is the alternative and can I create a more delightful user experience? CRM, we talked about that. And now all of the, like Slack uses uh, this in a radically transparent way. So uh, every person in the company could query uh, what is our ARR, annual recurring revenue, what is our churn, what is, how many users, who's, how much money are we getting from each of our clients. This is all, it also contributes to um, a radically transparent culture. I don't know how many of you actually uh, have hard business questions, but at Slack there are no hard business questions. Everybody could query those questions from an intern to the CEO using Slack. And of course, we put our money where our mouth is, and we uh, we open up a fund. Uh, we the fund is split 50/50. Uh, uh, Slack put 50% of that money, so 40% came from uh, Slack, and the other uh, the other uh, $40 million came from our uh, VCs who have turned LPs in that fund. So that fund is now managed separately, and what it does, it invests in companies who are creating bots, not just on Slack, but on multiple other uh, platforms. Um, so this is something that uh, you might want to consider if you're building uh, an ecosystem of developers. And this is um, vanity numbers. Uh, a lot of people ask me, uh, when you're building a platform, when you're building an API, how do you connect the API to what's important to the company? How many of you are developers, engineers? OK, so you use APIs, uh, or you develop APIs. How do you connect between the APIs and what's important for the company? How do you get your APIs funded and supported? It's very simple. Connect it to the, what, what's the most important for the company. With Slack, what we've seen is that people who use the Slack platform, 70, sorry, 70, 97% of our paid customers use the platform on a weekly basis. And that's correlation. But if you want to actually add causation, we did an NPS, a net promoter score. Do you know what's a net promoter score? It's a question very popular in the, in, the, in the Silicon Valley, where you ask a customer, how likely are you to recommend this product to other customers? It's the, stronger, the strongest uh, indicator of uh, happiness from customers. So when we ask customers, why are they so happy? One of the top three reasons was we can run our bots and it's all connected to all of our software. So always think about how do you connect and how do you create alignment between your API and your platform and what the company is focused on. So from our perspective, um, nine months. Um, and also, there's a few other vanity metrics. OK, so let's look into the future. 2016 was the, oh, there's bots in the world. 2017 was the year of shitty bots. Everybody was bot shit crazy. They were all trying to create bots all around the world. Most of the bots sucked uh, and created bad, uh, bad experiences. But then a few solid use cases started emerging. There, there was Alexa and Google, um, and Google Home. Um, there was StatsBot. There was Amy's, a still a successful startup in New York. 
Um, there's one uh, called K Knowledge, which is uh, awesome um, by the, the guy in New York, the Israeli guy in New York. And what it does, he bought uh, 40 years of HMO, of Shirote uh, Brut Klelit data. And now when you tell the bot uh, it, what, what, is, what are your symptoms, it actually tells you, hey, you should go to the doctor and check it out. Or 70% of the people who had your symptoms had, I don't know, uh, flu or something like that. And, and he's growing like crazy. We're going to see more and more interfaces that are like that. Um, then there's, uh, a so AI is going to become transparent. I'm sure all of you, even if you don't know, you're using AI every day. Uh, how many of you search at Google? At Google? Okay, you're using AI. Every moment of our life, AI is the kind of technology that the minute you use it, you actually use it, you don't know that you're using it. It's just a better service. I'm not using an AI-powered car, I'm using a car that could drive itself. So all these uh, technologies are called transparent technologies because they're going to be all around us and we're not going to know that they're, they're powering what we do. So AI is becoming transparent, and software is becoming part of everything we do. Um, I was really um, excited about Ford announcing that they're going to uh, embed uh, Siri, uh, Google Home, and I'm not sure about Siri, Google Home and Alexa in their next uh, year's car. So every car is going to have a conversational experience. Uh, that's a great use case because your hands are on the wheel, and you want to talk to software at that moment and change to Galgalatz immediately. Uh, and uh, all, the company, all the platforms are going there. Uh, it's really easy to see that big names are betting uh, on the platform uh, of conversational interface. Uh, there was a consolidation of uh, acquisition that happened uh, last year. Um, API.ai was bought by Facebook. Um, Natural language understanding, that's Lewis, provided by Microsoft. Uh, IBM has Watson. Uh, sorry, this was uh, API.ai was bought by Google. Uh, Wix.ai was bought by Facebook. Um, so all the big players are bidding on providing infrastructure for developers to build bots. OK, so we're going to see conversational software all around us. We're going to talk to software. Uh, and now we need to think about how does your company and how does your innovation connect into a world where you don't have an interface, where you just talk software over text, over voice, over any other medium. Um, and then we're, we're moving from web to mobile to messaging. And most of the users are now moving and interacting with software on messaging. Uh, and we're going to see software everywhere. I already said that. Sometimes. Um, one thing to think about is when to build a box. Uh, people ask me, does anything need to fit a bot? The, the answer is no. You need to build a bot only when. It's a short and contextual workflow. I wouldn't do your taxes with a bot. Maybe it will work. I think it will be a sucky experience. If it's a long-form conversation, I'd rather fill up a form. I don't need to talk to, to, a, to a person. I already have that experience. It's a sucky experience. Let me just fill the form. Um, when it's short and, con and contextual, when I want to take, hey, I want to take my uh, vacation next week, that's a short and contextual uh, conversation. When the alternative sucks, like doing an expense report, if you, if you, if you think about um, an experience that sucks in your business life, that's where bots could really help. Um, with DevOps, we've seen a lot of success. Uh, GitHub has actually done all their DevOps using uh, chat. They coined the, world, uh, the word chat ops, and they create repositories, they deploy, they uh, monitor all their servers through a conversational interface. So uh, if you're building your dev uh, op and operations, uh, it would be great to uh, build it over chat. Um, and, and then, um, this is interesting, where the conversational funnel uh, outperforms where Bomova. Uh, how many of you know what funnel is? A funnel is a process where the user goes through a, through a flow, a lot of users go through a flow, and less and less of them go through each step of the flow. So uh, a thousand people land on, on uh, Amazon.com. 50% 50, uh, 50 of them choose an item. 20% of those uh, click buy. 
10% uh, of those put their credit card in and put their address. And 2% of those, these are, these are all false numbers, 2% uh, uh, of those actually finish the transaction. That's the funnel because it looks like this. It looks like a funnel from a user perspective. Now, when you think about a bot as a user interface, you need to compare the web funnel or the mobile <laughs> funnel with the conversational funnel. Will I move users from zero to hero using this new user interface in a better way? Will my conversion be better or more uh, delightful for my customers? If that is the case, then bots is a great solution. If that is not the case, throw bots and think about another user interface. Thank you. You're an awesome crowd. And now we can take questions or stand here awkwardly for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, I'm interesting. You, you talked about Amy. Uh, wait, Eric, can you? Yeah, the here. Yeah. Here's the microphone. So you talked about uh, Amy. Yes. Which I think is the most interesting about you uh, introduced here. Um, and this whole world of having bots proactively communicate with the world around you, not just responding to your requests or viewing data. Where do you see this? Is this something that's being developed? And not just at Google. We saw Google with the ordering uh, yeah. restaurants, which I don't know was scripted or not. Some, some of them, some of the rumors say it wasn't that authentic. Um, so where do you see this? Going is this something that's being actively uh, developed, and is it something that's that people are ready for? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I've seen I've seen a few startups that are trying to augment humans with uh, with thoughts, and I think that is one of the cases that we'll see uh, with support. I'm sure supports support bot are going to be a big thing. So they're going to be a first line of support. You're going to talk to a bot. You might or might not know that you're going to talk to a bot. And when the conversation becomes hard, it will automatically or not automatically transfer to a human. So I think that is a definite use case. I think uh, another use case is that works like Amy is going to be sales representatives. Uh, there, uh, we've seen uh, efforts by Live Person and, uh, and other startups in the, in the Valley where the sales uh, uh, process is going to be performed by a bot. Uh, from my perspective, I've seen another uh, uh, startup that was really useful for me is a bot that manages all your social interactions. So people ping me in DMs a lot in, in Twitter. I could build a bot. Somebody's building a bot. Um, I can. Whoa, bot is misbehaving. I think that's a production issue. Oh, production issue. Uh, so. I can build a bot that represents me, so that like augmenting myself. I've seen another two interesting startups that actually ask you a lot of questions about yourself. So you confess, you transfer your personality to the bot, and now the bot could answer on your behalf for most of the questions. And that's a little bit free freaky, like uh, Black Mirror freaky, uh, but also kind of exciting. More questions. Yeah. That's it. Uh, which one was the nicer and uh, got into Alexa and uh, Google? Oh, the question was uh, who's nicer? Was Alexa was the nicer and uh, Google was the better? So I, I, I want to start with a prefix. I do not represent my company at this moment. <laughs> uh, at any moment now, I'm on vacation. Um, my kids thought that uh, Alexa was nicer and that Google Home is smarter. Um, I think the key with Google uh, Magic that they've done is to connect uh, Google Home to search, and that, that is magical. Because they, their hit rate, or you ask them a question, even if they don't have an answer, they have a delightful answer that you didn't think about. Even if they didn't understand you, their fuck-ups are, are, are funnier because they, they rely on Google search. So um, it's a, I, I think from a... Um, smarting from a smart perspective, um, Google Home is currently smart. Yes. I have a question. Here. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the first thing is uh, my name is Leo. Nice to meet you. Uh, the first one is uh, please 
specified challenge that you encountered in doing one of the bots that was kind of funny, you know? Because I heard this uh, radio show when they asked Alexa, uh, why do you think all the small names should be executed? Oh, I see. And she has this... Uh, I, don't, I can't help you with the location. Yet, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I, can, I that. cannot help you with that, but good luck. Yep. On that. So, and you can ask your second question later. Uh, so I've seen uh, things, uh, funny things that I've seen is that all bots, male or female, are sexually abused. So everybody's trying to do something with the bots. Um, it doesn't matter that I, we've tried with different gender to see if this helps. We've tried with gender neutral bots. Everybody tries to fuck with the bots. Um, the second thing is, there is a very strong correlation between uh, emotions and the usage of, of the bots. So uh, there, uh, there's actually a startup that does Google, uh, like Google Analytics for bots, and they have the mean time to I love you or I hate you. Because users really, really fast tell the bot if they love them or they hate them. Uh, and that's really awesome because if you think about software with buttons, there's no way for me to tell the, the app I really like this interface, or this interface sucks. But with users, uh, with conversational interface, the users tell you immediately, oh, this is horrible, I hate this bot. So we've seen a lot of like emotions, strong emotions, to either to each direction with this user interface. Yeah. Right, so uh, one of the experiments that I tried was I trying to teach my son manners, and uh, one thing that I that I try to do is that whenever I uh, ask Alexa to play music, I say Alexa, thank you, and I've noticed that it actually catches on. And uh, is this something that's being researched in terms of? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, so making bots, um, making kids polite with bots. Um, I've seen research uh, done by um, both Google and uh, Amazon on that. And um, when the when the bot is prompting the user to ask uh, to to get questions or when they respond to to thank you, when they when the kids hear when the kids say thank you and the bot says oh it's very nice of you, then the kid will say thank you and thank you and thank you and thank you. When they get the bio uh, feedback, uh, that's amazing. By the way, the same thing with um, with Twitch where I work right now. Bio feedback, getting feedback to the user is super critical. Um, at, at Twitch, people subscribe to uh, to other streamers. They spend money subscribing to other streamers. So I remember seeing my kid first subscription. He subscribed to uh, Ninja, which is one of our favorite uh, stream, well, not our, one of our <laughs> biggest uh, streamers. Um, and Ninja says, "Thank you, Johnny." And my kid's like, "Whoa!" I was on TV. So uh, it, when you when you're thinking about user interface. I always think about biofeedback. Same thing with, with kids, with making them uh, be more polite. Always, even if you're the bot, whenever they do something good, if you give them the biofeedback of like, yeah, what you've done is awesome, that's, uh, from my experience, uh, a very uh, effective way with humans and with kids. Uh, Dan Ariely, who's one of my favorite speakers and a good friend, he says that people uh, really like to, to hear compliments, even if they uh, don't, uh, if they know that you're not sincere. And then he goes to a random person and says that they're the the most beautiful person that they've met in the world. And you see this person's like face smile, right? So we all like this type of feedback. Okay, uh, and you're awesome. Thank you very much.